and everybody here at the British Library and all our friends joining us all over the country in the Living Knowledge Network libraries. It is fantastic to have you all here. I'm Polly Russell and I'm the curator and founder of the British Library's annual food season. There are so many reasons tonight to be super excited about what's happening. First of all, this building is open for the first time in 10 months after a major refurbishment. So we on staff are thrilled to be back in the theatre. So that is just wonderful to see you all sitting here. Um, the second is because tonight is the launch of the 2023 food season. And I just could not be more proud to have this event, Chinese and British food, to start the very wonderful food season with this exceptional panel of speakers. The food season brings together talks, tastings, workshops about every aspect of food. And what we want to do is to amplify the most urgent, the most wonderful, the most fantastic voices in the food world. Do find out about all of the events that are going on over the next six weeks. Look at the website and please come to as many as you can. You're all food people here, so you know food is the only subject. Um, so everybody, you should just come to all of them because they're all absolutely brilliant. I just want to take one minute to thank some people who are involved in the food season. One is my friend and partner in crime, Melissa Thompson, who's a guest director for the food season. Also, Angela Clutton, who can't be with us today. And also, Joe Allen, who's the food season assistant. I also want to think, thank all of the events team at the British Library, who both let us get on and do what we want to do, but also provide amazing support and make it all happen. And so the food season could not happen without all of these amazing people, but also all the speakers, many of whom are here tonight, who are going to be part of the season. So thank you, everybody. The third reason that I just think this is super exciting is that tonight's event is part of the Chinese in Britain exhibition which is on at the British Library just across the way. It's a free exhibition, it's closing on Sunday, so it, tell, it is urgent that you take yourselves there if you can. It tells a fascinating story about the multiple and complex lives of, through photographs, manuscripts, interviews of Chinese in Britain and beyond. So please do hurry up and see that. But the Chinese exhibition has not just been taking place here in London, it's also been uh, staged in 60 public libraries throughout the, the UK, libraries who've been discovering and celebrating their own stories of Chinese and British history with their communities and with their own collections. So it's a wonderful project and it's so fitting that tonight's event is happening. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Melissa now and Melissa's going to tell you exactly how this evening's going to run. Thanks, Paul. You're so good at this. Oh, um, and just say thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, it's a... Uh, what? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll get to the point, right? So um, at the end of the conversation tonight, um, the panel will be taking questions. So do think about questions as you're going along and, um, and get them ready so that we can get as many questions in. If you're watching online, um, there's also um, a, 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 like a... a little form that you if, online that you can uh, put questions in there and then we'll try and read out as many as possible so get them in really quick because like, it's always that little bit isn't there everyone's like oh I'm thinking so just get them in straight away um, and also our panel are going to be signing books um, outside in the foyer where you just were I know some of you already got some but if you haven't just go and buy all of them and get them signed because it's like a brilliant opportunity right? I know it's like you have to lug them back but don't worry about that um, and also, um, if you're watching online, you can also, there's a link to the bookshop um, and you can buy them um, through our, our bookshop. Right, so um, I'm very excited to um, welcome our panel to the stage, not just yet, right? Um, <laughs> this is uh, sort of, like, very exciting, an amazing group of people, um, and in a moment you'll be meeting them. So we have uh, Ken Hom, um, Angela Hui, Helen C, si, and uh, Andrew Wong. Um, and the chair for tonight is the brilliant Jeremy Pang. Um, I'm going to introduce Jeremy, and then he will introduce the rest of the panel. So Jeremy is a TV chef, um, a best-selling author, and founder of the acclaimed cookery school, School of Walk, where I learned to make dumplings. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and you know him from t TV, from like Sunday Brunch, um, uh, Radio 4's Kitchen Cabinet, um, and he was also on television um, last summer with Jeremy Pang's Asian Kitchen on ITV. Um, and he's an yeah, incredible author, incredible person. Um, so please, everyone, a massive round of applause for Jeremy on our panel. 
I thought we had our own lion dance there for a second. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? I, I've uh, clearly been given the tallest chair because I... Uh, well, we won't go there. Anyway, um, good evening, everyone. How are we all? Yeah, I'm excited. Claire, Ken's excited because I've decided to have a glass of wine for the night because um, usually I do a lot of talking, but tonight it's actually all about the panel. Um, and... Um, uh, I, I, I just sort of wanted to start with uh, the, the, the exhibition, Chinese in Britain, because uh, I, I have to admit I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm terribly uncultured, usually, and uh, I'm not very good in museums or exhibitions. And I, I can, I, as I was growing up, I never really sort of lasted any longer than 10 minutes. But this uh, exhibition really captured... Um, uh, sort of my feelings and emotions, and I came uh, uh, when it just opened a couple of months ago, uh, and it was an unexpected sort of sense of nostalgia uh, from other people's stories. I'm not sure if you guys have gotten that uh, from walking through uh, either today or, or, or when you have. Um, uh, and I, I think there's a couple of stories, if you haven't seen it already, um, uh, the seafarers of Liverpool... Uh, who, who, you know, a couple of thousand of them came over uh, and then got deported back um, uh, and, and uh, without really knowing that they were being deported um, uh, and, 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 uh, and left their families um, with their children, you know, wives with their children and, and that was that. That, that was quite a, quite a um, heart-wrenching story actually to, to read. Another one, another little artefact that um, I was admiring earlier when I bumped into to Ken and Andrew um, uh, it was the Ming's restaurant uh, Dole's house, uh, mainly because everything was so miniature but so correct and precise. <laughs> um, which, again, I, just, I, I think that there's, there's so much to it. There was also an artist, I think he's in the audience, he might be in the audience t t tonight, who was, who'd, who's come back a, a few days in a row to draw um, parts of the exhibition and um, has sort of dotted around asking for a little autograph from his drawing. Um, uh, and he tested me because he asked me to sign my name in Chinese, um, which I had to practice on my sheet. Uh, it's right here. <laughs> um, I think I've got it right. My mum's in the audience. Don't, um, don't say anything, mum. Anyway, uh, about, enough about me. I, I'm, I'm honoured to be here. I, re I really am. Um, uh, there's a couple of reasons, uh, mainly as a, as a good Chinese student, um, uh, my mother, who is very much here, uh, the, my tiger mother, uh, here in the audience tonight, um, <laughs> which many of us, I'm sure, have had uh, 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 yourselves as well, um, uh, would, would be proud, I'd say, because I used to come to the British Library um, once in a while during my A-levels and university uh, to, to, um, to pass time, let's say, um, with my friends. Um, uh, more importantly, I'm truly honoured to, um, uh, to, to, to be here uh, with such a panel of, of stature. Uh, let's call them the dames and knights of the British Chinese round table. Um, they're all sitting right here. I'm not going to go in any particular order, but I am going to start with Ken Hom. Mm. Big round of applause. <laughs> uh, Ken Hom, OBE, everyone's uncle, not just yours, Andrew. Um, the legend of Chinese cookery, uh, full stop, really. Um, uh, if I paid I, him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, how long did it take you to decide which of your two books would be on that table tonight? Because I, how many books have you written? Oh, my God. 40? Uh, in English. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we've got Helen, Helen Z, MBE. Let's, let's call you, Helen, the, the sit-in sister to us all tonight. Um, uh, an owner of the famous Sweet Mandarin, uh, author of many books, but uh, uh, also of, of Sweet Mandarin, which is more of a story. That's right, it's a biography. A biography about your family. Yes, about three generations in the restaurant trade. Right, and we'll go into that, uh, I'm sure, more as we go through. Andrew Wong. More and more famous over the years for his two Michelin stars and counting. Uh, if you count how many times 
uh, you've won your two Michelin stars cumulatively. How many Michelin stars do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Not as important as his CBE, though. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, Angela Hui. Um, <laughs> who I believe you've already done a talk here? Uh, last year. Last year. <laughs> um, whose eloquent, fearless words, I believe, represent us all in one way or another. Um, a, an award winning journalist and editor from South Wales, oh, uh, and author of an in the incredibly honest and personal book, Takeaway. Stories from a Childhood Behind the Counter, which I'm sure many of you have read, but if you haven't, <laughs> as Melissa said, there's plenty of books out there. <laughs> um, so to all you wonderful people, uh, I welcome the panel. <laughs> so we've, we kind of have brief introductions, but we're on a bit of a time scale here. <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, I think we're going to start with a, just a quick sort of, before we get into the nitty gritty, a three minutes, let's, let's give it three minutes for each of you. Let's start with you, Helen, because you're, so, you're right next to me. And, and I'd love you to give us a, a full summary in three minutes um, <laughs> uh, of your own <laughs> British Chinese life, uh, why you're here tonight, and what impact the exhibition had on you whilst walking through the aisles. Okay, um, that's a tricky one. <laughs> um, so I'm from Manchester. Um, great to be here today. Um, I was born in, in Manchester above Takeaway. Um, and then I became a lawyer. Uh, I worked in London and Hong Kong. And then I moved back into the restaurant trade with my twin sister Lisa and Janet, and my other sister. Um, and we set up a restaurant called Sweet Mandarin in Manchester about 20 years ago. Um, then we went on the show called The F Word with Gordon Ramsay, the good one, the good show, not the nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we won the um, best local Chinese restaurant, and we beat 10,000 restaurants for accolades. Thank you. So um, the Sweet Mandarin um, restaurant has um, kind of evolved into different. Um, Things like the book, which was about the story of the family, um, the cookbook, which is predominantly gluten-free and dairy-free. So we're very much into the allergen space. Um, you know, you go to a Chinese restaurant and you say you're allergic to nuts, they'll say there's the door. Uh, <laughs> but we, we do welcome people with our allergens and that's, that's our specialism. Um, and I came in to see the exhibition today and it's very, very um, emotional um, because it reminded me of my childhood, especially the, the, the doll's house, which was, you know, all the little uh, bits that were in there, like the wok and the rice cooker was amazing. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much you can fit in a small kitchen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it just took me back to my childhood days. And um, the really weird thing is when I was growing up in a takeaway, we really hated it <laughs> and we didn't ever want to go into food. So it's very ironic that I'm actually <laughs> in the restaurant business still after 20 years. So um, that's me for now. Thank you, Helen. I, uh, let's let's go to let's go to Andrew. Let's go across mainly because I know you're about to fall asleep. So um, <laughs> <laughs> let, let's let, absolutely, let, Andrew. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so yeah, your 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 own British Chinese life. You get you know you, you've had a uh, maybe a different upbringing as well. You, you know, Helen sort of gone in and out of becoming a lawyer and then going into the restaurant. You've not always been in the restaurant industry. Or have you? No, well, my, my parents had a, had a restaurant. Um, my grandfather had a restaurant in Chinatown. And my sister and I, my sister who's in the crowd today, mm -hmm. um, very talented children's author, um, we grew up not wanting to work in a restaurant. So it was always the trade-off. You either study or you go work in a restaurant. <laughs> so she went to do a master's and a PhD and everything. And I, I went to Oxford um, temporarily until I got thrown out. Um, <laughs> basically avoid being in a restaurant. Um, and that was always the trade-off. That was always the understanding. Um, and that was, f we played by those rules and that was, that was fine. Uh, but while I was at university, my father passed away. And so I went initially just to help my mum out. Um, initially I went back because she had a restaurant and I thought, okay, I'm obviously underqualified, but, but I, at least I've got two hands, right? And, and half a brain. 
Um, so I went back into it. And then you know, it, the, the strangest thing is that actually, I look back now and 17, 18 years have passed now. Um, and I'm not quite sure what happened, to be completely honest. <laughs> um, initially, it was just like, well, you know, we'll just make it up as we go along. And then one thing led to another. We closed the restaurant. Natalie and I reopened it again in 2012. Um, we made loads of mistakes, I remember. Um, the worst one was not having bin bags during service time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Sainsbury's. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you're lucky. We'll get seen <laughs> walking across the road to Sainsbury's to buy bin bags. Um, but no, I mean, there is no grand plan um, when you open a, a family-run mm -hmm. restaurant. You just go with the flow, make mistakes. Hopefully, you, you, you get blessed with a little bit of luck, and we did. Um, and then from that, we, we grew, and we, the team grew, and the cuisine grew and the restaurant grew, and then, as I said, 17 years down the line, um, it's now this monster. <laughs> um, we have like 40 staff looking after 35 guests, um, and I'm not quite sure how it happened um, until the accountant reminds me of payroll. Um, <laughs> and no, every day, I mean, it all started, I remember distinctly, Natalie and I only ever said that, wanted to create a restaurant that we wanted to go to. That was always the underlying um, mantra behind the restaurant. And everything that's followed from that has just been an expression of that. And you had a look at the exhibition today. Yeah, the exhibition. How, how did you find that? No, it, it, it's, it's touching, but in a weird kind of way, it, it's <laughs> more poignant for me personally, I think, because I'm sure a lot of people in the, in the audience can, can relate to this. Like growing up, you hear little sound bites from your relatives, from your grandmother, maybe you have a great grand grandmother, your mother, you know, your relatives from Hong Kong, your relatives in England, and they tell you stuff. And you just you go, hmm, how much of that is true? And then you you get it into you come to an event like today and you go to the exhibition and you begin to piece together um, bits of these fragment, fr fragmented fragmented um, stories that you've been told over the years. And some of them you're gonna go, oh right, mum was definitely lying to me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the other stuff, you kind of go, oh, I really get it. And you like, you, my always one is like, I look at some of the pain and like the, the anguish that my parents went, went through and some of the baggage they used to carry with them when they used to say things. And then you see it in black and white like that in an exhibition. And it really drums home that, you know, as a second or third generation um, ethnic minority, we have it so easy today in comparison mm -hmm. to our parents and mm -hmm. our grandparents and, and our great grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I sit here now, you know, saying that we have this restaurant, blah, blah, blah. None of that is possible without the incredible efforts and the, the, the pain and the suffering that our ancestors went through in order to give us this privilege. And I think that's what stuck with me more than anything walking through that exhibition. Uh, I, I'm desperate to, to, to go sh straight to Ken, but I, 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 I feel like we should leave him to last because he's got a lot more life to talk about. So, <laughs> um, so, so, so I, I'm the I, oldest one here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Angela, let's, let's, let's go to you next. Yeah, um, I, I'm from Wales. I grew up in the Channing Stageway, like Helen, um, and I worked there for 20 odd years. Um, my parents owned it for... 30, um, and then I think I was working behind the counter since I was eight. So I had a little stepper stool that I would, because I couldn't reach the counter, so I had to like <laughs> use a stepper stool to serve people. That was when you were eight? I was eight, yeah. <laughs> and I then had that when I was 20. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's true. In fact, it, it was yellow pages, yeah. <laughs> Stacks of um, and yeah, so I was working there with me and my brothers. We worked there for like, you know, all day and night and mainly prep work would help out. You know, we'd go to school and then work uh, bagging corn crackers and doing the chop and chasu and mushrooms and stuff like that. And like Helen and like Andrew, I hated working there because, you know, you, you just want to kind of be a kid. You want to play. You don't really want to be stuck helping your family, you know, peeling prawns. You stink. <laughs> and then you go to school, and then you're like, oh, you smell like sweet and sour sauce, and you get bullied for it. <laughs> um, so it was just talking about all of that, essentially, just wanting to do your own thing and find your own path. So I think that's when I left, uh, when I went to London to find a job. 
I wanted to do something completely different. So I want to do fashion and music and then realized everyone's horrible in those industries. <laughs> and then accidentally fell into food um, and then realized I loved it and not realizing it's actually an option or like an actual job. Um, so, you know, falling into food writing by accident and then, you know, ended up there. And then, yeah, that's pretty much how I ended up doing what I do. But yeah, um, we'll go into your writing because I think it's really, uh, it, it, it's, weirdly seen as a bit of an alternative career path, but it, it's such a crucial part to the whole world's education. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into that as we go. Yeah. And, and the exhibition, wh what did you think about that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've seen it three times now, I think. It's like the doll, like the, the dollhouse. It's just everything is like down to a T from like the flattened cardboard box, like the anti-slip mat when you work into the kitchen, um, the terracotta tiles, but I just, love that there's actually an exhibition about the Chinese and British, um, you know, growing community. And, you know, I never really knew about the, the Cardiff, like, laundromat. So a lot of Chinese workers, they started out as laundromat, like, work running laundromats and then going into the hospitality trade. And then, yeah, learning all about the, the Liverpudlian seamen that were, like, uh, forcefully deported. So I think it's in incredible that there's something there now, like, I would never have thought that would something to see an exhibition like that during growing up at all. So yeah, it made me feel really emotional, similar kind of experiences, kind of PFT, PTSD looking at that kitchen again. <laughs> um, but we all know who the yeah. SWAT's in this panel. <laughs> um, but no, it's just really heartwarming and kind of emotional as well to see all the amazing stories and the you know anecdotes and the collection of books and everything there as well. Too. On to Uncle Ken. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> this is... <laughs> <laughs> Your British Chinese life. Yes. I, and, and, you know, I've got three questions, three minutes, so you need to do this part in one minute if you can. <laughs> um, but tell us about your life uh, as, a, <laughs> a, a, as, as a British Chinese. <laughs> as the oldest one here, my life is very long, but <laughs> it's been um, a comedy. Um, it's interesting because my career has been over 40-something years. Um, I was born in the States, in America. Um, I did not speak English, which is my second language, until I was six. Um, I only, only spoke Cantonese. I became a hippie. Uh, <laughs> I, did, I did smoke dope when I was young. <laughs> Uh, I worked in my uncle's restaurant when I was young, and I said, I never want to be in the restaurant business. I tried everything to get away from it. So eventually, I started teaching cooking. It started to do very, very well. I was commissioned for my first book, and the New York Times did two full pages on me. And my New York publisher, which is the biggest publisher in America, um, uh, went from 2,000 copies, we're talking about 1981, uh, to 29,000 copies and put me on a 35 city book tour. I met uh, this young black girl who interviewed me in Baltimore named Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> this is how long I've been around. <laughs> I was interviewed by Martha Stewart at House Beautiful before she became Martha Stewart. <laughs> anyway, I met all of the, <laughs> the glamorous people of America, so my career was taking off. Then I met a woman named uh, Matter Jeffrey, and okay, uh, I was an admirer of hers, and I said, oh, this lovely Matter. This was in 1982. And I, I went to France, and I came back t t to my cooking school in Berkeley, California, and I had all these telegrams. Remember, 1982, no mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> I had about eight telegrams. Please call me. Uh, English television wanted to talk to you, da, da, da. So I called her back. I said, Nador, I mean, I'm, my career is just taking off now. I'm getting all these big corporate things, and well, I'm finally making some money. <laughs> and she said, at least talk to them. 
So make a long story short, I talked to them, da, da, da. They've been searching for someone to do a Chinese cookery series for over two years. They had interviewed 50 candidates. I said, my English is not that good, I, da, da, da. But it's okay, we'll get back to you. They flew me over for an audition and they said, we want you. Why? If you ever, you can see my audition tape, it's really humiliating. They, re <laughs> they released it for the 100th anniversary of the BBC. <gasps> my, it, you yeah, you can still see it. Were you, were you a hippie? It's embarrassing at this point? <laughs> because um, I have to tell you also the backstory of all this. All the time I was teaching about Chinese cooking. Uh, I was teaching at a school for professional chefs as well. So rather than to just to be a cook, I explain why I did something. So in my addition, I'd never done television before. I was freezing. I was going, uh, I look like, a, like somebody said, a deer in headlights. <laughs> but they said, when you started cooking, you explained everything so well. And they said, that evening, the executive producer said, we want you to do this, but the money, Americans, they pay big. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> okay, I said, okay, I'll do it for fun, okay? I had a cookery school by that time in Hong Kong as well. I was taking chefs and people to Hong Kong um, in the month of April and October, etc. So BBC thought, this is great, we'll film. Now, I never thought, okay, I'm gonna do this series. It might be a flop, especially the cleaning lady who came in the small flat that BBC rented for me. And she would say, what's that Chinese muck I smell? <laughs> and my friend said, this is not gonna fly. So I thought, okay, I'll do this series. It'll be a lot of fun. I really love London. I love the English people. And uh, I fell in love with fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Uh, I love fish and chips. Anyway, I, I really got to be, uh, this took about eight weeks. We had filmed in Hong Kong and et cetera. Well, when the series came out in 1984, I don't imagine many of you were around then, <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, um, it was the um, biggest printing of a book, uh, nonfiction at that time, 350,000 copies. The book was 26 weeks on the bestseller list. I couldn't believe it. But I was so mortified and traumatized by doing the series that I could not do another one until my wonderful producer came and said, Ken, we don't have to do a studio. We'll do it. We can go out. You can be yourself. And you don't have to learn lines. <laughs> I remember they, they, they gave me a cassette. Do you remember video cassettes? They said, <laughs> it was of Delia Smith. They said, we want you to be like this. <laughs> I said, I don't do drag. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I know I had long hair, but I, you know, <laughs> and I can't talk like that. <laughs> Why is that not in the exhibition? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the exhibition. What what did you? What well, you know, I was very touched by it because I knew a lot about um, Asian American history, Chinese American history. So a lot of the exhibition here was a mirror of what was happening in America as well. And uh, I was very touched by it. Um, it so, so what you're saying is that us Brits can't think for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's, let's, let's move on a little. Let's, that, that was a very long one minute. Anyway, um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but, but you know, you've answered quite a lot of my questions already. So I think I'm, we're gonna sort of touch on it, sort of coming back to the rest of the panel. Um, and, and, and my next question is, is sort of more, again, about your personal journeys. And I'm going to start with you, Angela, because um, you talk a lot about this in your book. 
um, uh, which is, of course, hugely personal to you, um, but perhaps resonates with a lot of BBCs here in the, in the audience. Um, did, did you actually see yourself as Chinese from a young age? You were born in Wales, weren't mm. you? Um, well, I would say I was quite lucky and privileged. You know, my family were very, very traditional, very Chinese. We spoke Cantonese at home, and all I spoke was Cantonese. So before I went to nursery, I couldn't speak to anyone because all I could speak was Cantonese. And at home, we would watch uh, TVB, which is the Hong Kong channel. I would watch Chinese cartoons. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday, we'd go for dim sum, and we'd go to Chinese school. So I was really lucky that my parents, you know, always made sure that we never lost that kind of Chineseness to us. And every other year, we would go to Hong Kong to see extended family. And then, you know, working in the Chinese as well, being in this very like Chinese environment, but also going to like a Chinese restaurant, and then going to school in a very very white school where you know me and my brothers were the only people of color. And, you know, you, it becomes very jarring and then, you know, you don't really see any peers, you don't see anyone that kind of looks like you. So I was very confused. Um, you know, was I Welsh? Was I Chinese? I wasn't really sure who I was. And this, you know, I w wanted to so badly fit in, right? But, you know, working in a takeaway, you kind of have a target on your back. You're in immediately the Chinese one or you're called something uh, very racist. So, yeah, it was very hard growing up because I was never really had anyone that I could really turn to that was that wasn't like a friend or like a family and it wasn't until I moved to London that I really realized like oh there's other Chinese people that's not my family you know? <laughs> and um and because it's such a small you know it's tight-knit community I think it's like where I grew up is like a population of like 4,000 people there's barely anyone there so when you come to like a place like London it's like a metropolitan city that Walk, every walk of life is here. So I think it wasn't until like after I moved away that I really needed that to be surrounded by other, you know, East and Southeast Asian people. And it wasn't really until like the last, I would say like the couple of years since like the pandemic happened, you know, I reached out and met a lot of people I like online who felt the same things I went through, you know, all this like anti-Asian hate. And we kind of bonded over the hate, really. And <laughs> <laughs> no, but just coming together over like a crisis or, you know, bonding over things that are outrageous or the same things that we were really frustrated by. And it's amazing to have this community that feels the same for something that I never had growing up. So, yeah, it was always very torn. I'm not really sure who I was, whether well, I was Welsh or Chinese, but I'm both of those things. And would you say that was relatively recent, that sort of bonding over anger? <laughs> well, I think in the last couple of years, that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so I should reword that. But, you know. No, but like the same, you know, mental, like the same things that you care about, you know, you're passionate about wanting to be seen um, within representation, within film and media, and, you know, not being depicted by COVID, how, you know, throughout the pandemic, Asians were kind of painted in a bad light because we were kind of the carriers of the virus. So you kind of bond over that and, you know, you feel the same passions that everyone else, like a lot of other people do. And thanks to social media, there's a lot of that that we kind of rally behind. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like in the last, you know, five years, I would say I've started to really feel, really understand who I am and become more comfortable in my own skin um, than I ever have in my last like 20 odd years of growing up in Wales. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. Really, really personal like perspective. Uh, Andrew, you you grown up in L London, and but you one of the things that intrigued me because obviously, if if you don't know that the sort of, I guess the co Chinese community sort of movement from Limehouse area and uh, you know in, in London towards Soho, you know the restaurants sort of started opening up in Soho. W you said your gra was it your grand. Dad owned a restaurant in, in Chinatown or around that area yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. On Gerald Street. Why did your parents open in, in Victoria? <laughs> because my granddad said, that's my spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't create uh, competition. That, that's a, su that's a, su <laughs> that's a summary of chef's life <laughs> or, or a summary of how the Chinese really are. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my, my dad had a very interesting um, interaction with that whole period from the 70s to the 80s where he was, first of all, um, a, a publican in the East End. Mm -hmm. uh, great stories about that time. Um, his car got set on fire three times for refusing people drinks. People were going with hammers and smashing each other around the head. 
Um, and this was why my grandfather was having his restaurant in, in Chinatown. And then my granddad moved to Hamburg because um, he had read in the newspaper that there was a, there was a position um, to be a middleman for the trading between the Chinese um, in Hamburg. Um, and so he flew over to Hamburg um, to try to uh, expand his horizons, ended up finding a nice uh, small hotel, um, ended up taking that over and running that for a few years, leaving my mother to look after my sister in a pub in the East End <laughs> um, with a gun probably. Um, <laughs> Um, and then he came back and wanted to open a restaurant. And obviously my grandfather had a restaurant in Chinatown. So he wanted to find an area which he thought uh, would be good. Um, I'm not sure why he went to Victoria. Um, but he, he, there was this computer shop which uh, was coming up for um, sale. And he decided to camp out for a year. <laughs> to do research on, on uh, traffic flow on this, uh, ah, yes. this, uh, this high street in Victoria <laughs> um, and until they were ready to sell. And then he opened the restaurant in, in the beginning of the early 80s. It opened in 1985. That's amazing. So he worked out how many sandwiches he might sell and then he, he went for it. The, 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 uh, yeah, I, I'm genuinely intrigued by this because with that, that opportunity that he created for himself, your, your, your dad, you know, I, it's, I, I think, has, has that set, set you apart in location before anything else? You mean you know, you're, you're, part of for, London? No, for now, no, <laughs> as in, we had Chinatown, we've got Chinatown, and then you've got Bayswater, and then you've got A Wong <laughs> in <laughs> Victoria. <laughs> like, you know, do, do you think that's actually, like, given you a, a more of a chance? Well, um, Marina in The Independent, described the restaurant as being in a scuzzy part of London. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what scuzzy meant in 2013, but I looked it up. Um, it's not flattering. Um, <laughs> you know what? I think the, the honest truth is that if I was not to open a restaurant in that exact location, I would never have opened a restaurant. Um, you know, growing up, I was okay at school, you know, like the rest of, I'm sure there's a lot of you in the crowd who, we, we got a few A's, you know, like, <laughs> cooks. Um, you know, I, I, I got into Oxford to study chemistry. Um, I got into law school, but just didn't show up on the first day. <laughs> um, so the only reason I opened a restaurant on the original site that Kim's was, was because that we grew up in that, on that site. My sister and I used to get locked in the office, and there used to be all the wine on one side, so you have to like, go to the get into the office. And then there was a photocopier here, I remember. And she's got oh, photocopy stuff. And so she'd stick me on top of it, put my hands on, just, <laughs> zzz, zzz. <laughs> and then obviously, once you photocopy your hands, you're like, oh, what else can we photocopy? <laughs> <laughs> That's um, not good. It's not that type of talk, <laughs> Um, so that, that site had so, so much sentimental value to it that, you know, we grew up there. We had so many birthdays there. You know, when my dad said he was going to take us to the seaside, he took us to the restaurant and said, go fishing in the pond. Um, that was in the restaurant. Um, and if it wasn't for those memories, I don't think I would have ever opened a restaurant. Um, I probably would have, I don't know sat in an office somewhere and had an easier life, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, Helen, you, you seem to have followed, let's per perhaps the, the more traditional um, ch Chinese child route in the sense that we all know that our parents, if we're, they were in the industry, they wanted us to be lawyers, accountants, possibly engineers, <laughs> <laughs> but not chefs. To, when you were studying law, and then when you became a lawyer, did you know at that point that you were destined to be a restaurateur? Oh, no, definitely not. I mean, um, we opened Sweet Mandarin in 2004. And at that, that point, I was a lawyer. Uh, my twin sister, Lisa, she was in finance. It was all the, you know, stereotypical <laughs> jobs. And Janet, my younger sister, was an engineer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we I, you know, I actually didn't know that. <laughs> um, and uh, the three of us gave up the day jobs to the horror of our parents 
to open up Sweet Mandarin. And when we went to the bank to you know, raise funds, nobody would lend us any money because they didn't <laughs> believe 320 somethings were going to you know, make it work. So what we all did is we each sold our house and then moved back in with mum and dads who were even more incensed. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, they're like, you bloody idiots. <laughs> and then we bought a plot of land in Manchester. Um, it was the back streets of Manchester, also away from Chinatown, because you can't buy in Chinatown. Um, and we built the restaurant. Um, so that's how we started the restaurant. But the, I guess uh, the reason why we set up a restaurant probably stems back much further in my memory. Because um, you know, I said that we're from three generations of women restaurateurs, but I grew up in the takeaway. Mm. So you know, I guess there's one part of the story missing, which is we actually lost the entire business before I was born. And um, my grandmother and mother lost it to gambling, <laughs> which is a really uh, difficult and prevalent situation in the Chinese community. And it's probably not talked about at all. Mm. Um, but that basically ruined the entire family. Um, and it was always ingrained in us that this had happened, but you know we were ho helpless to do anything about it. So when I was 11, I remember this very clearly, but um, just like you, we helped to take away, uh, finish school, get into your overalls, you know, serve customers, yes, please, any some vinegar on your chips, <laughs> that kind of thing. And it was one Saturday night, and mum, my mum was serving this in, in the shop as normal. So dad's at the back, mum's at the front. And this thug came in and demanded a bag of chips for free. Um, and my mum, being very principled, said, no, you know, get out of the rest, get out of the takeaway, you know, you're not being served. And um, he punched her. Oh. And she hit her head against the back of the wall and she, she slumped down. The glasses were broken. I was 11 at that time and I was watching it and I felt totally helpless. But it was what he said afterwards, which was like, get out of this country, you don't belong here, da da da, mm -hmm. all these horrible racist terms. Mm. And, um, you know, being 11, I didn't like the fact that I was Chinese and being the only Chinese in our school. I didn't like my flat nose. I was reading uh, Little Women um, by Louisa May Alcott, and they were putting pegs on the nose to make it more straighter. And I tried that every night, and it was still as flat <laughs> as anything the next morning. Um, but I didn't know any other home but Middleton, Manchester. Mm. So whilst I was very insecure in myself and how I looked, um, I was not doing well at school, I wasn't fitting in, this was my home. Where am I going to go? You know, go back to your home. Where's home? Home is Middleton, Manchester. And I felt so helpless seeing my mom and, um, you know, an assault had taken place and we were helpless. And it was that moment, probably my crossroad, that made me think, you know what, I've, I've got to do something to try and help my family, you know? And the, so then the three of you went into business. Well, that's why I became a lawyer. <laughs> know my rights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take my family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? and, I, but it was, it was always, um, you know, this family, um, longing to restore the family name, mm. you know. So when we did have enough funds, which was selling the house, we built Sweet Mandarin. Um. It's an amazing story, Helen. And I think, like, you, you know, we can all take a lot from that. And I think, that, that, I think that's part and parcel why the exhibition for me sort of really resonates, because th th you, you sort of read about the hardship, and that's... that's uh, that's a big part of, um, I guess, why we're all here today. Um, uh, I think let's 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 move on to the next next topic, and that is why what we all really do, uh, and that's British Chinese food. Um, uh, so um, uh, to get into the nitty gritty, I think it's, it's, this is a quick fire round, um, uh, and and the question is, it, it's a it's a very short question. Um, and it, as much as possible, keep it as close to a, a one-word answer, if you can. Um, um, uh, where was prawn toast invented? <laughs> <coughs> Let's go back to you, Helen. Well, we'll go along. Well, I believe that, you know, the mantau bun? Yes. Um, in the north of China, Beijing, met with the, the fish and the seafood in Guangzhou. 
and they put it together and they made prawn toast. <laughs> so you think it comes from northern China? Northern... I, I, I think two people came together. It came from Manto, northern China. Manto, <laughs> okay, northern, yes. no, think... I've never heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Angela. I have no idea. Can, like Guangdong, like south? Okay, maybe? Guangdong, yeah, know. yeah. Ken? Hey, listen. Did you I'm invent it? No, no, no. <laughs> 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 Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chinese are very smart. They go, look, they said, well, prawns, how can we get the maximum out of this? And bread, toast, uh, we don't have toast. But where? Go on, <laughs> you're, 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 going, you're doing politics so, here. They What's said, it? No, so they said, we're going to take this bread, put it on, fry it. And I always remember when I was told, non-Chinese people like everything fried. So <laughs> that's... Actually, Tesco told me that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, you get royalties for saying Tesco. <laughs> no, no, um, no, 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 no. Um, which, which country? Where, where was it? Was it invented here, the US? I think probably the, the US. The US. You reckon the US? Andrew? Well, the filling is mm. a Hagao filling. Yeah, That's right, definitely yeah. from Canton. Mm. Yeah. But porn toy on toy, I think, was invented in Walthamstow. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you laugh, you laugh, you laugh. <laughs> you reckon? Because. Well, it's yeah, a kid city or country, not a town. I was talking to this Michael Robin, and his dad invented crispy aromatic duck okay. in the 60s. Yeah. And he was no, in Walthamstow. He, he was the chef yeah. in the um, Chinese embassy <laughs> who did a runner to come out, <laughs> and he realised that Peking duck was just too long a process to cook for every single person in the restaurant. So they came up with crispy aromatic duck. He definitely came up with that, and he definitely came up with seaweed, which is basically deep fried kale, right? Right. Or a form of kale, right? And I think, you think crispy prawn on toast may have been his one as well. In, in Walthamstow. <laughs> in <Okay>. Walthamstow. <laughs> Any takers from the audience here? <laughs> I, I tried, well, prawn toast apparently was invented in Hong Kong. Wow. Yeah. yeah, can you believe it? Uh, as a fusion food of Western Cantonese fare, prawn paste and toast, delicious. Mm. Um, what are your favourite British Chinese dishes? Ken, we'll go to you because you invented prawn toast. <laughs> <sighs> Definitely not uh, chips or curry. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Yeah. The first no, time I came to this country 52 years ago, <laughs> I went to Chinatown and they served chips with curry. I said, what part of China is that from? <laughs> <laughs> you are bringing out Angela's anger right now. <laughs> Sweet gravy. Sweet gravy. <laughs> so what's your favorite? What's your favorite? What's my favorite? Uh, just a simple, good, well done stir fry of anything. That's all. With wok hei, which means mm. hot enough. Oh. Uh, the audience is suddenly very hungry. There's people who understand yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Chinese are like the French. They're such a pain. They talk about what is wrong with this dish, what's right about it. They complain. <laughs> oh, oi vey. I mean, <laughs> stop complaining. Eat it. You know? <laughs> OK, so, so stir fry for you. Let's, let's go to you, Angela, um, because you, first of all, you have to defend chips and curry sauce. Oh, yeah, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, and is there anything particular Welsh Chinese that uh, we sh perhaps should know about? Yeah. Well, in Wales, they love fried things. And in um, the chip, like chip shops, so basically a lot of Chinese families, they took over old Jewish fish and chip shops in the 60s. That's why you would get like fish and chip shops as well as Chinese takeaways. And um, usually they would like customize everything. So in Wales, they would have um, a rissole, which is like a corned beef ball, breadcrumbed and then deep fried. So corned beef. Corned beef. Wrapped in. Breadcrumb. Breadcrumb. Deep fried. Are you taking notes of your cookbook? <laughs> 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 what are you doing over there? I've got another two to write, Andrew. That's a lot of content. She gets rotty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you would have that in the, you know, the. Uh, fish and chips, like the window bit, as okay. well as a potato scallop, which is like a big potato wedge, right. and then battered. 
Um, but usually they would have like half and half, which is like a chicken curry, egg fried rice, and then chips, much to your dismay. Um, I, I feel like you shouldn't good. have sat you two next to each other. Because <laughs> this, this could get dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people would, when, we, when I grew up in the takeaway, a lot of people would customize their own and make their own monster fusion like uh, thing. So they would have like, you know, shredded crispy beef and chicken, as well as like chow mein and then curry sauce on top or like egg on top. Like, it gets really out. Wow, yeah. wow. The Welsh are creative. <laughs> um, uh, 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 Andrew, let's, 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 let's go to you. Can you bring yourself down to the rest of our levels? <laughs> um, uh, let's talk prawn toast and what was it? Corn beef. Rissle. 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 Let's call it corn beef rissle. <laughs> Do you have a personal favourite? No, I, I love all food, right? <laughs> all Chinese food. Um, whoever's cooked it, uh, it makes no difference to me whatsoever. Um, and I, I do think, actually, I know, I know you want one word answers for this, and I'm going to... No, 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 we're good to talk now. You're good to talk yeah, now? Yeah, we're good okay. to talk now. Right, yeah. I think a lot of the time, people, they latch on to this understanding of it's authentic, or it's this, mm -hmm. or it's Welsh Chinese, or it's Chinese, English, British Chinese, or whatever it is. Primarily, I think, and again, this is just me, so don't quote it as being fact, um, a, a chef's job is primarily to use the ingredients mm. as available, mm. use our skill to interpret it in a way that is true to us, whether that's in our heritage or our training or whatever it might be, and it's to feed the people around us. And I think sometimes people misunderstand, well, they forget this, mm. and they're too busy putting things into pigeonholes to say, oh, it's not this or it's not this. Mm. And you know, my restaurant, in all honesty, is probably like number one in the firing line all the time for guests saying it's this or it's not that, it's this. You're doing this, you're doing that. It's not from here, it's not from there. That's great. And I hope it makes you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> but primarily, that's mm -hmm. my job as a chef. My job as a chef is to be respectful to my heritage, using my training and my understanding mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. celebrating what I believe is um, our culture in a very respectful and celebratory way. Mm. Um, back to your, your one word answer, it will probably be something like um, crispy aromatic duck. I think it's iconic. Yeah. That dish has gone back to Hong Kong, it's so iconic. Yeah. You can have crispy aromatic duck in Hong Kong. 10 years ago, people were like, what? Yeah, true. Hong Song app, what? Have, but have sweet and sour chicken balls gone to Hong Kong? Yeah. No. I've got a lot. I've never tried sweet and sour chicken balls. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I had a, a builder doing renovations in a restaurant. He was explaining to me about chicken, and I, I honestly had to say, I'm very sorry. I, I've never tried that. <laughs> uh, Helen, is that something that is, is you guys cook? Sweet and sour chicken. Yeah, no, oh. sweet, sweet and sour chicken balls, <laughs> specifically because <laughs> because there's sweet and sour chicken, and then yeah. there's the sweet and sour chicken balls. balls. <laughs> right. So in the in the takeaway, we would do. The balls that you're right. talking about. <laughs> okay. So talk us through so your that's, recipe. That's the fish batter. <laughs> yeah. That's the fish batter you want, you know. The fresh batter. So it's a, it's like a... It's a fish, it's a fish and chip batter. Oh, it's a fish and chip batter. Yeah. So you have self-raising flour? Or... Yeah, or, or, or <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they don't want to know the recipe. They want to know... <laughs> yeah, self-raising flour. I'll write it down later. Half, <laughs> half plain, half self-raising flour. Half plain, half, half, half salt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A bit of salt, yeah. Water. Water, any make, type of water. Make it thick like cement. Right. Okay, put the chicken in. Okay. <laughs> and then drop it into really hot oil, <laughs> over 200 degrees, yeah. And what about the sauce? Sweet sour sauce? Yeah, well, yours, yeah. You have a, do you have a particular recipe? Because <laughs> we, we get this asked this a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, over the last 15 years of running school or what, we, we get this asked this a lot. Oh, no, I want it specifically like the takeaway from down the road. I was like, well, I don't know where, I don't know See, where you live. The thing yeah. is, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you put together the number of Chinese takeaways and restaurants there are, is actually more than McDonald's, KFC, and Burger King put together. But we do not have a unanimous, you know, brand one type. Mm. Um, so it's very hard to be exactly like your local takeaway because every mm. chef has got their own version of sweet and sour. Like ours is from dad, and that's what I've got to follow. Mm, she's been very sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> but every, every sweet and sour does have the basic condiments, which is ketchup, ketchup. and vinegar. Right. It's just what kind of vinegar, what kind of ketchup. Right. Yeah, how much sugar. Do you put soy sauce in or not? We don't. You know, you can't do that. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to tell her my recipe. Um, 
Uh, it, it, let's let's talk about it uh, a little bit more with you, Helen. I think it, you know. Are there are there any old favourites uh, in in the restaurant uh, that are absolutely the same now than sort of you know you, you know when you first started? Well, I've got, I've got to say the curry, chips and curry sauce. <laughs> Half, half, and uh, half. Oh, my. <laughs> so it's half chips, half curry, half rice. Oh, really? So half chips, half curry, half rice. Yeah. So same, same as Angela. This, this curry has been the same through three generations. Okay. And it's the curry that my grandmother made when she came on the ship from Hong Kong to the UK <coughs> on the SS Canton. Mm. And uh, sh this, this ship took, you know, months in those days to come over here. Mm. And it would stop off in places like Singapore, and stop off in India. We wheel its way through all the way, and every time she stopped, she learned how the different curries were made. <laughs> so our curry has got like you know, coconut base. Mm -hmm. It's got the spices of India, you know, mm. and then she made it her own because um, my grandmother was in servitude, so she was a maid to a British family. That's why she came to the UK, and they love spicy because they hadn't really tasted it before. And um, Mr. Woodman, he was looking after the. Um, utilities in Hong Kong mm. and decided to come back to Somerset because mm. he wanted to go back to <coughs> British life. So she made this curry specially for that family. Um, and so we keep the same tradition and the same uh, curry even to say, you know. And do, do you, you and your sisters like to eat that personally oh yourselves? Oh yeah, I mean we have people, <laughs> when they know we're closing, <laughs> when we're closing for Christmas, yep. people bring, you know, the margarine tubs, the yep. big ones. <laughs> They will ask for 20 for Christmas. <laughs> and they'll freeze it and they'll use it for the turkey. It's perfect with turkey. Mm. You know, turkey's so dry. Nice. Right? Um, so that curry has been in the family for, you know, I can't change it. It's been That's the only way a Chinese person will eat turkey. Will you? <laughs> 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 uh, so, so I think to, to the whole panel, I think like, uh, like there's, there seems to be a, bit of a divide between chips and curry sauce and otherwise. But <laughs> I, I think um, uh, there, I have some theories myself about. Um, about British or influence that food has had from the Chinese to the Brits and the Brits to the Chinese. Mm. All right, so uh, I'll give you one of mine, my theories. I don't know if it's true, but I, it, it makes sense to me. Uh, and it's ketchup. Cared up. Yeah, yeah. Cared up. Uh, I, I genuinely believe that was it also like prawn toast invented in Hong Kong because Fan care. I don't, uh, my Chinese is terrible, so if I'm saying this wrong, you guys can slap me on the wrist later. But fan care, tomato, jup means sauce, right? So care, jup, tomato sauce. Ketchup, if you say ketchup in English, you can't do it the other way round. <laughs> can you? Can anyone do that? Okay. Can you say ketchup and then translate that into Chinese? Somehow? No, it, it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work that way. So. So, like, that's my example. If you guys, uh, to the whole panel, let's go, let's come, go, let's start with Andrew and come all the way down. Like, is there anything that is, uh, like, you believe is, like, heavily influenced from one culture to another, from British to Chinese food, or vice versa? Again, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, the, the, the pretentious one trying to overanalyze it, but I think all food is. Right. Yeah. I genuinely think, I think that people mis have misunderstand that somehow Chinese food is one cuisine which is it's stuck in time mm -hmm. and actually we need to look at food diachronically and you have to look at it over 3,000 years over 14 international borders China is the biggest thief or sponge of other people's culture <laughs> <laughs> and actually our cuisine or whatever you, whichever regional Chinese cuisine you're talking about is a combination mm -hmm. of the Persian Silk Road the Ottoman mm -hmm. Silk Road mm -hmm. the trade coming from the West dim sum contains butter there is no indigenous butter in Chinese cuisine until it arrived in Guangdong, right? Citronese food, what well, the main ingredient in Citronese food is chilies. Mm -hmm. Chilies did not arrive in China until the 16th century during the Colombian exchange. The Portuguese. Right? So what are we talking about? China as a cuisine has always been about bringing in all the very best from around the world. And then from that, you do the same. So in the Forbidden City, the emperor used to always recruit all the very best chefs from all over China to cook for him in the, in, in the, in the Forbidden City Palace. And then you start talking about kind of colonial, kind of British trade. And when they went into, um, into Guangdong to start trading with the British, then I always use this story of it. it's like the Wolf of Wall Street. So basically there were these, these middlemen who started like going, oh, well, let me do some trade with you. I can trade the silk for the spice or whatever it might be. And they sent out the word to all the chefs around China going, we have these new multi-million pound 
foreign traders in Guangdong now. We need to bring our A game. We need to try and show them uh, food that's going to impress them and tell them to come back to do trade with us repeatedly. And that's the origin of dim sum. And people talk about tea houses, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. The tea houses, yes. But fundamentally, the principle that I always hold on to is that. It's the idea that there was a demand. And from the demand, we brought the very best knowledge from all over China to create something truly special, which has then been shipped out again to the rest of the world and has almost become an iconic part of our culture in other people's cultures. Yes. And I would agree very much with uh, Andrew on this because it's adaptation that has made Chinese food one of the most popular in the world. There's a book that is out called Have You Eaten Yet? And it, it's a, a documentary where this guy, he's from Canada, he was from Hong Kong, he <coughs> went around the world filming Chinese restaurants and how they've sur not only prosper but survived is because they've adapted. They, they would take indigenous thing. I remember, uh, you know, when I went to uh, Helsinki, they asked me to stir fry reindeer. Okay. Like, it's like a piece of beef. But um, the, uh, the ability to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. This is what made Chinese cuisine survive around the world. And uh, as, and, and Andrew is right. What's authenticity? Authenticity is that, does it taste good? Is it cooked correctly? And at the end of the day, that's what counts. Mm -hmm. Angela? Um, yeah, I mean, basically what Ken and Andrew were saying about adaptability, I think that's why like a lot of, well, I think like Chinese takeaways, they don't get the praise that they deserve. You know, a lot of our parents' generation, grandparents' generation came over and cooked Chinese food, but they adapted what Chinese food was. You know, they, they probably couldn't serve, um, you know, Feng Zhao, which is like chicken feet and like dim sum menus, which will probably scare a lot of people off. So yeah, they adapted um, a lot of the food to local tastes to, you know, use like that's how, um, you know, stir fry tra trap chop, su uh, chop suey was invented. It's just using what was available and- Yeah, what is chop suey? Uh, it's just like mishmash, like uh, odds and ends of like cabbage. Everything left over. Yeah, everything left over. You talk, you talk no, about that British. in the book, mm. what, um, but you guys meant, you called it something else. Uh, we had our own, we call it Four Seasons. Four Seasons. <laughs> Sorry. That just Sorry. Like, that's some m and marketing right there. Yeah. Uh, no, it's because Good we, we adapted it to whatever we had, so... Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of dishes like chop suey is using what was around. Mm, so yeah. during then there wasn't a lot of abundance of like seafood mm -hmm. and pork. So they would use a lot of tinned items. So that's why it's like bamboo shoots and water chestnuts. So like hardy vegetables like onions and peppers. That's why a lot of them are used in Chinese takeaway cooking. So again, it's like this adaptability to local tastes mm. and what people are like, what people like. Well, if you've got good wok hay, then you can mm, kind of cook yeah. whatever you want, yeah. can't you? Yeah. But um, yeah. what I really find interesting is um, similar to like ketchup, I guess that's very Chinese yeah. uh, sauce, but there's, um, the, have you heard of OK sauce? OK sauce, mm. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell us about OK really sauce. Classic. This is fun. Yeah. So uh, OK sauce is um, a British sauce, which is made by Coleman's. And I think it was like in the 60s and it's kind of, it's like brown. It's almost like a sweet and sour sauce, but it's like brown made from like raisins and shallots. And you would have it with like crispy beef. And I find it really fascinating that it's kind of the way around, which is like a Brit very British sauce that was made in the post-war and it's adapted to the Chinese market. So now you get it in Chinese supermarkets. There's even Chinese words on the bottle mm. that says like right. sweet and sour sauce, uh, even though it's all common. So I find it really fascinating that this, like you say, is just adapting, using mm. what's around and basically like taking on everything like a sponge. So yeah, OK sauce is used in a lot of Chinese takeaways. So it's almost like a plum sauce, sweet and sour sauce, but it's brown, yeah. not very appealing. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. but but you there's a few yeah. sauces like that, aren't yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's Worcestershire sauce, mm -hmm. uh, also used quite a lot. And then there's other sort of canned products, uh, you know, like the soup, the Campbell's soups or, or condensed milks. 
like you know all those sorts of things that you find in mm -hmm. like the cha cha mm -hmm. in Hong Kong still. Like, wh wh what about you from from a you know Helen? Like, do, is there anything that like sort of jumps out at you that that is like you know particularly influenced from one culture to another? Um, no, I think there's you know we've, we've kind of covered quite a lot of bases already. I guess what we're trying to do is do an extension of it to deal with the allergens. So, you know, the OK sauce or the sweet and sour, yeah. um, we make it without gluten. Mm. And actually, um, we even sold it back to China. So this crazy, is the sauce right? range? This is the sauce, yeah. Because I don't know if you, if, for those who don't know, like Sweet Mandarin had uh, their own sauce range yes. for quite a few years. Yes. For how long, how, did, how long did you run? Probably about eight years. For eight years, and that went into all the supermarkets? Yeah, so we're in all the supermarkets and um, it went back to China. And um, Premier Lee heard about it. He said, who are these girls selling Chinese sauce back to the Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get summoned? Well, he came to the UK to do his grand tour. And then um, my sister Lisa, she got a call on Tuesday. And it was David Cameron. <laughs> and he said, um, Premier Lee's coming to the UK and he's asked to try your food because we want to know what's going on with this sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you selling the sauce back? He's, he's like me, he's trying to steal our recipes, yeah. Um, uh, so so the, the, that journey must have been quite stressful. Like, what, was it good? Did you, did you, did, did it work? Yeah. Because okay. going into the sauce market, it's all, you know, especially the free from the sauce. The free market. from sauce, yeah. I, like, that's a really modern sort of way of thinking. It's, it's not something that you would, I mean, I, I thought about it with, but my, and my business partners wanted me to do it. I just didn't have the, 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 the confidence to do it, to be honest. Like, you know, there's yeah. some big giants in that industry. What, what, what made you do that? Um, well, a lot of our customers are celiac, which means they can't ingest gluten and wheat. And then we have a lot of dairy free people, nut free. So we were already doing these sauces without all the other, you know, extras. Um, and then one guy said, look, can I, can you put it in a bottle? Because I want to take it to Cambridge for my mom, because she's also celiac. So it started very, you know, granular. And Lisa was like, OK. Then another customer, he's like, I, I make labels. Do you want some labels in exchange for the sauce? <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll make some sauce labels. <laughs> so that started off. And then um, some of the corporates that we do cater <coughs> for said, look, we've got these um, you know, end of year parties for the staff. Do you want to have a, st a stall for, for charity and sell your sauces? So we sold it. Within 10 minutes, they're all gone. So that's how it started. Um, then my sister. So I, I, today I'm standing in for Lisa because really she does this kind of chat, not me. So I apologize, you know. Um, but she is very business savvy. So she said, look, um, the basically BBC moved to Manchester. Um, so a lot of producers come to our restaurant. And one of them was doing Dragon's Den. I was like, we just can't get anybody to do it, you know. Can you, can you come on and do your sauces? And Lisa was like, I haven't got any bottles, I haven't got any labels. <laughs> so, don't worry, we'll knock it up. So uh, that's, uh, that's what <laughs> happened. Literally, we literally <laughs> stuck it on <laughs> for the TV, you so know. Wait, stuck you didn't it on. have sauces before Dragon's Den? Not in that bottle. <laughs> well, were, you know those wow. uh, curry tubs? <clears throat> that's how we sold them. <laughs> I should have gone into business with you guys. That's amazing. So amazing. we went on Dragon's Den, we got investments, and you know, it was in Sainsbury's, Tesco's, you name it. So we got, it was good fun, you know? Uh, now, the thing is, you ask a lot of the mainstream sauce people where you make our sauce, they can't guarantee it's gluten free. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't put our name to anything that we couldn't promise to, you know, the customer is absolutely number one. If I can't do it, I won't do it. There's no point, you know, dabbling and then getting it wrong. Because, you know, with celiac disease, you, if you ingest any gluten, it's non-repairable. You can't take a headache tablet and it's gone. You've damaged the intestine for good. But that was too much weight on our hands to, to risk mm. it. So another plunge, we got a factory. <laughs> Started the sauce business. Um, we went to all the shows like Anuga for food and drink. Um, Cial in Paris. And we started selling the sauces by the pallet load. And then we even had a call from Russia, one of the top supermarkets, saying, can we take your sauce? I said to Lise, I'm sure this is a spam. 
Because <laughs> <laughs> they ordered 20 pallets there and then, and that was a lot of money to output before we get the money in. So, you know, using my lawyer brain, I said, yeah, we can do that, but we want payment up front. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, no, we don't do payment up front. <laughs> because you need to, you know, invoice and then we'll pay you. No money, no honey. So I said, okay, we'll invoice you. <laughs> yeah, no money, no sauce. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, so we invoiced them. <laughs> we got the invoice in first. Made it, you know, and they did rather pay. than 28 days, we did seven days. Got the money and then we, we shipped it out. So, you know, that's how we protected ourselves with the, with the people that we didn't really know. Mm. It's, it's a very hard business to do with supermarket. Uh, it's completely different, isn't very it, between business. restaurants and supermarkets? Yeah. But I think I, I think a big round of applause for them actually yeah. getting into that. Like that like, yeah, it, we've we've been there, done that, and taken the fail, failure, and and that is you know well done to you guys. I think the the last sort of bit that I wanted to, to touch on was sort of moving more towards the future of, of, of British Chinese food. I think we've talked about what we like, what we don't like. We know Ken doesn't like curry sauce and chips. <laughs> but the, 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 it, let, we'll stick with you, Helen. Um, from, from, because we're, we're talking about the, the sauces and things, from a mass market sort of Chinese food perspective, perspective uh, uh, do you think taste buds are changing? I do. I think a lot of people are asking for more spicier sauces. So sriracha became very hot, you know, very hot property as well, as well as the hot sauce. Um, and we noticed uh, a lot of customers wanting Sichuan dishes, literally laden with, you know, the dried chilies. Mm. And so, you know, we, we adapted and put a few of them dishes on for them. Um, but I think, you know, in any business, you've got, to, you've got to be flexible and be able to listen to your customers and hear what they want. You know, there's no point saying, this is all I offer and, you know, nobody comes in. Uh, you know, it's been, very difficult during COVID. Mm. Um, and it's still difficult now with the rising, you know, utilities and the, the, the wage costs and you know, all, all the other costs that are going up. But if you listen to the customer, not just the food, but also the service and, you know, the whole ambiance and whatever they, they say to you, if you take it in and don't take too much offense, I think you can survive, you know? Yeah, I think it is, I, d I do agree with you. It's, ch it's changing. It's qu changing quite quickly in the last sort of, you know, just four or five years, to be honest. I think, Andrew, you, um, Helen mentioned Sichuan, Sichuanese food and, and the oil the, 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 and the chilies. Like, it, do you think, yeah, you've done quite a lot of travels around. You, I know, also know you studied quite a lot or you've worked with sort of cultural experts around the history of Chinese food. Are the changes that are happening uh, how do they link to, to the hist to history? Like, well, I think I think the changes in food are a reflection on, of the changes of the community in whatever area it is. So, you know, my restaurants in in London, so I can only really speak about London. My kids go to exactly the same primary school that I went to, so I see history transposed onto itself, and I see. A lot of change. If I compare the way that I, I interact with my heritage versus the way that my kids interact with their Chineseness, it's completely different. You know, when I when I went home at night, I was like, I am definitely, until my sister joined later, the Chinese kid in this school. When someone described, or when I described another member of my class, first thing you notice was he's Chinese or he's black or she's Indian. When my kids come back home and they're describing their friends, they never talk about race as the first thing. They always talk about the person who likes this or the person like that or the girl who's fantastic at maths or whatever it might be. And I think that's a reflection of change. I think things are changing. Change takes time. You need to have um, people who are willing to stand up and make a stance, shall we say. Um, people who are a lot more daring and a lot more gutsy than myself. Um, but change takes time. And I, I look at the way that the Chinese community, mm. um, the way that people interact with our community, the way that I go to Siwu now, I go into Chinatown now, and it's such a different mix of people. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Chinese shop around from where the restaurant is. I see loads of kids from all different backgrounds going in to get bubble tea, 
eating nori seaweed. Man, if I was, when I was growing up, if I saw one of my friends eating nori seaweed, <laughs> I, I don't know what I would have said. You know, ordering different dishes from all over Asia, you know, embracing parts of our food culture. And that is an entry into our culture. And I think that, as a symbol of the movement that is happening in London, I think is very heartwarming. And I think that the food, as we describe it, you're talking about the change, that is basically um, the gateway to a lot of people interacting with our community. And I think it's, it's such an honor to be part of the Chinese hospitality community purely for that, if anything. Uh, and I, I feel that as time goes on, what we'll find is that more and more parts of our culinary heritage will be integrated into mm. mainstream cooking and understanding. Mm. Um, you know, um, all the techniques that Ken promotes um, in one of his 40 books, they will just become <laughs> mainstream parts of people's repertoire when they cook at home. And, you know, I, I obviously, I, I hang around with loads of chefs, and they're always asking, how do you make a chasu bao? How do you make seal yolk? How do you make peking duck? How do you make yolk? It, those techniques are very specific to our culture. And the fact that chefs who are not from our culture are trying to learn these techniques <coughs> and trying to integrate it into their own cuisine, it really goes to show um, the magic behind what we have to offer and the historical heritage and the richness that these techniques hold. And I think once that becomes part of their mainstream repertoire, then, you know, it's free for all, I think. It's open, open knowledge for everyone, you know. It's, it's whatever you can do with it, whatever you can do to integrate it into your own cuisine, your own cooking, your own availability of the ingredients. And I think that's when you're going to really see some really special magic happen all over the world. Mm. Uh, Angela, I'm going to come to you because... <laughs> After the applause. Um, uh, I'm going to come to you because Andrew uh, mentioned sort of making a stance, and I think you are um, you, you sort of very quickly becoming a voice uh, to the people in many ways with your writing. Uh, we, there's a lot of talk around adaptability, uh, perhaps actually trumping authenticity in some ways. Um, where do you see the future uh, of British Chinese food um, going? Uh, and, and how do you see education around, from your writing or, or, or similar writers to yourself uh, helping with that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, kind of what Andrew said, it's like you have this kind of gateway, right? So, but, you know, back when I grew up, a lot of people's gateways was probably like Chinese takeaways, and that's kind of their introduction to it. And, um, you know, they would find like, oh, the egg fried rice, and then they slowly learn from that, right? They'll learn from like, oh, I really like egg fried rice or chow, uh, chow mein, and then they want to try to learn more and then open up the palates. And I, and I, I think that's great. You know what I mean, I think from there, there's a lot more regional Chinese cuisines now. If you look at Chinatown, you can probably get, you know, it's like not just Cantonese food anymore. It's like Cantonese mm -hmm. food as well as like Hunanese, Xi'an, and Uyghur, and um, Sichuanese. And, and I think, like Helen said, people just want more spicy things. <laughs> um, but I think it's this acceptance, right? It's kind of you break down the walls of something like, oh, that's really exotic or like, that's really weird or it smells funny. Once you get past those barriers, people want to like, learn more about the cuisine or like the history or the pathways or how it came to, the pl uh, came to be. And, and I think once you kind of get over that, it becomes norm. Like what Ken and Andrew were saying, it was just like, it becomes part of our conscious. They're like, oh, that's, you know, everyone will know what wok is eventually, or like everyone will know um, what like, you know, bitterness is, like different palettes or different textures or become kind of normalized in a way. So I think it's like, as long as we kind of keep sharing about it or talking about it or point out the differences or, you know, defend when things are wrong, you, that's how we can kind of grow and learn from it, I think. Um, yeah. Great. And, and Ken, I come to you for a bit of a summary, really, um, because <laughs> you've led the industry, uh, as you've quite rightly said to me, uh, since way before I was born. <laughs> um, I, and, and Chinese food has changed a lot since the 80s. Uh, where do you think it'll go from here? Well, only for the better. Just like food in this country, it's 
going the way uh, Andrew said, global. What I mean by that is we're learning about other people's culture. We're accepting other people. I'm, I mean, it's not all perfect. It's three steps forward and two steps back. <laughs> but we still advance <coughs> by one step. And I, I can see that um, in this country. The, for instance, the quality of what you're getting, people are much more demanding. I thought it was very funny when I took the, um, a taxi to come here. Um, I was talking to, the, I love talking to these drivers, these black cab drivers, and he said, he has a five-year-old girl, and she said, she's always asking for sushi. <laughs> I said, does she know how much it costs? <laughs> 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 I mean, five-year-old, and I mean, this guy is, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's sophisticated enough to know food and et cetera. But his five-year-old is asking for sushi. And she said, she's in love with sushi. I, that's fantastic. And that's how the world is changing. It's all these young people that grew up with food of the quality that Andrew makes, of uh, what you teach in your school, what uh, Helen does and what Angela does in her books. You know, all these kinds of things contributes to the knowledge that we're all amassing about food. And we're all mixing it together, but for the better. It's, it's not chop suey. <laughs> it's, actually, yeah. it's very d distinctive. And um, we can only profit from it. So that's great for everybody. So I see the future as pretty bright. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's genuinely been fascinating, uh, this discussion, especially because we have these four wonderful panelists. Uh, to me, what I've taken from this is that I think today we've gotten uh, quite a lot further than just egg fried white rice, sweet and sour <laughs> pork and crispy chili beef. But I think that they're, they're very important parts of our cultural sort of heritage. And that there are a few words that I've sort of written down, and that is that from, from the panel's sort of perspective, British Chinese people are very adaptable, creative, brilliantly entrepreneurial, uh, and, and most importantly, always ask the question, does it taste good? <laughs> um, uh, this is the time for you guys, so you, I, I think we're... Yeah, not bad. A little, a little, about 10 minutes behind where I wanted to be. But, I, but it's, it's sort of question and answers, really. You've got this amazing panel here. So it's, it's any questions that you guys have for the panel, now is the time. Hiya. Um, people are loving this online, by the way. I'm, I'm Maxime. I'll be asking online questions. Um, Viv is definitely trying to start a fight. Um, mm -hmm. She's talked a lot about north-south divides and ingredients, but her key question is, team rice or noodles? Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, we know in, in Chinese there's a, uh, a saying if you're a rice, you're a rice bin if you're a rice person. Yeah. Yeah. A fan yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, are, you, are you rice, rice or noodles? Rice, I'm rice. I'm noodles. Whoa. <laughs> well, I, I really hope I Ken's noodles, just, in, just no. so that we don't have another. Well, no, I have a reasoning for it. It's because it's like instant ramen. But you, well, instant rice is just crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can't get good rice. You get good freeze dried rice these days. Oh, yeah. the <laughs> no, no, I agree. Ken, rice or noodles? I'm torn. I, <laughs> I you dream can't be a torn noodle. You no, 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 I dream about rice. both of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew? Noodles, but I'll give you what, again, I'm going to be, I'm the one who, what, you're going to tell me to shut up, right? The Chinese government have basically now recently decided that it, um, rice cultivation is highly economic, uh, uneconomic, it's unsustainable, mm -hmm. and they're trying to change the whole of China to eat less rice and more potatoes. Mm -hmm. So they're at I the know. moment, <laughs> you ask this question 10 years time, what it should be is, <laughs> noodles or potato, or yeah, <laughs> chips, basically. Potato noodles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, great. Any other questions? 
We've got one here. Uh, just quickly for Andrew, really. Uh, first of all, deep respect. I've been to your restaurant. It's one of the best food experiences I've ever Thank had. Thank you. But my question is around, I also went to Kim's, your family's restaurant, 20 years ago. Wow. And obviously interacted with a different generation, I presume your parents and older first generations. Mm -hmm. What do they think about your take on Chinese food? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> I think, I think primarily my, my, my mum um, looks at the bank account more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> and says, as long as you can pay for my retirement, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but no, I think my, my, my mum's very open, I think. She eats out a lot um, and she will pull me out. She's, she's very harsh. You know, uh, <laughs> she used to be harsh on my grade card and she's harder on our, our food. Like, um, <laughs> but, but ultimately, I always take this as, as kind of like my, my kind of comforting semblance, which is basically when she goes out to meet her friends now, she can tell them that I'm a chef. And not, oh, he's still deciding. <laughs> I, he, he might go back to law school or he might go back to study chemistry. Now it's like, he's a chef. So I must be doing something right. <laughs> so another question just here. Hi. Um, a lot of the panelists talked today about more people accessing food, including people from different cultures. I'm just really curious, what does food being inclusive mean to you? Well, that's another being big question. Does being, being inclusive. What does food being inclusive mean to you? Let's go to you, Ken. Well, I think you can't be anti-Chinese if you love Chinese food. In other words, um, I think to be included, I always remember uh, working in my uncle's restaurant when we had all these different types of people who were not Chinese coming to eat. And you could see the minute they ate something good that was Chinese, you could tell that they're, they're not going to be, not racist, but what I mean, you know what I mean, uh, the way they look at you, et cetera. And you could tell right away. And uh, my uncle was very smart. He, he gave free, uh, um, free meals to the coppers, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is bring the, get the police involved. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you want to include people through your food. Anyone else want to add to that? Ellen? Um, well, I think there's many things in this world that divide people. But one thing that does unite us is food. Mm. And it's like Ken says, you know, through eating food, you appreciate, you respect, you gain an insight into the culture. And I would say also that nowadays there's 14 allergens that we've got to adhere to as restaurateurs <laughs> and chefs. And, you know, to be inclusive is to be mindful and respectful of that. A lot of restaurants still don't want to entertain the 14 allergens, but we actually go out of our way and the cost base is higher, but we don't charge a separate pricing <laughs> if you're gluten-free versus mainstream. I think mm -hmm. that's what I mean by inclusive. It's making it equal and price-wise. Making it a lot more accessible. Accessible yeah. and no, knowing that they're safe as well. And, and Angela, we'll come to you on this as well because you, you talk about it in your book uh, around your friends sort of coming to the takeaway when you were younger, things like that. Um, you, what did your how, did, how did your friends sort of take that? Did they enjoy coming to, to spend time with you in, in, in the takeaway? Because you were so busy there. Yeah. They used me for prawn crackers, really. <laughs> 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 um, no, I think it's, um, yeah, like Helen said, it's like the accessibility of it, right? It's just like learning to be able to like go into a place and not feel like you're overwhelmed and you're scared, which can be quite overwhelming, especially when you go to a Chinese restaurant, like the menu is massive. So it's like, where do you begin? So I think it's, you know, being able to kind of have that accessibility and be able to be safe with your order and you can order whatever you want without, you know, finding something else, I don't know. But um, yeah, I feel like with my friends, when they would come over, yeah, they would always come over for like egg fried rice or like special fried rice and they would just help and order. And, you know, they would come over in the day when we were prepping. My friends would sit around the floor and, like, 
peel spring rolls wrappers as well. Um, yeah, I think that's mainly what I have to add about inclusivity in food. Not dissimilar to getting children involved. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm sure there's a couple more questions I'm sure we can take. Yeah, um, here we go. We've got a question here, right here. Yeah. No, I can't see at the back, but there are a couple of hands. So we'll yes, this one. I have a question about um, food culture. So I was just interested. We talk quite a lot about specifics around food, but I was wondering things that surround it, you know, like chopsticks, you know, the soup ladle, the lazy Susan. What parts did you choose to bring into, you know, the new ventures, and what did you choose to leave behind? Are we talking equipment specifically? Yeah, I mean, I guess you guys all mentioned the doll's house as being something very, you know, touching, specific things there. So was there anything that you thought, in my new venture, I'm definitely not having this, or I'm definitely <laughs> having something else? Oh, that's, that's, that's a tough thing. Well, you know what? I, I think the best thing about Chinese food, which... Um, we have shared is about sharing. In other words, when you have the lazy Susie, everybody can share the same food, and people love that. I mean, I couldn't believe it when he, I, I went outside of my Chinese community and people, were, this is my plate, this is your, well, can I try some of that? <laughs> can I try some of this? And this is what's great about Chinese food. We have f uh, five, six dishes, and we have bits of everything we share and I think that's a great uh, uh, fantastic uh, trait that we've been able to share with people uh, and you think that's sharing. something we should always bring with us that's it yes I, I've got I've got one uh, and that is um, uh, to, 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 to get rid of the myth that only Chinese people can cook Chinese food <laughs> Because I, 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 when I started um, School of Wok, I used to go and do all my shopping in uh, Lung Fung, uh, in Alperton. And it was the vegetable ladies, very lovely ladies. They used to always say to me, your business is going to fail. <laughs> and I was like, that's not a very nice thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I did ask them why. And they said, well, you can't teach Western people how to cook Chinese food. It's just not possible. And, 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 and actually, it, it, interestingly, I know we talk about sort of the, the, the sort of racism from one way to another, but it, it, it's, it works both ways. And, and, and I, I think for me, as I'm sure everyone here on the panel will agree, it's, it, it's a shared sentiment that it, it's a very, cooking is a very practical skill. Uh, and I, I, one of my favorite movies is Ratatouille for the reason that <laughs> you, if you can eat, if you know how to eat, you know how to cook, right? Or you, 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 whether you think you do or not, that, that's, that's, that's one of the things I would leave behind. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any, any other? There, there's, some, there's some questions at the back. Let's, let's find someone at the back. The um, and, and the, oh, <laughs> so many questions. We can be, we've, got, we've got two minutes left, so let's, get, let's make it a quick question. Let's make Hello. It a quick question. Here I am, up here. Yes. To your right. <laughs> Hello. 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 Um, my best job when I was a schoolboy was in a Chinese takeaway. I communed between the front where she served and the back where he cooked. And I carried the, uh, the tab back to the kitchen and then the produce forward to the front. And he'd learned to read the Chinese characters whilst I was doing it. This was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Where were they getting the ingredients from? Have you been to the exhibition? No. <laughs> <laughs> Your answer's there. Um, we'll take one more question. <laughs> any, 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 any more answers? Hello? No. No. Hi. Yeah, Hello. just by the way, my, my, grand, my parents used to grow bean sprouts in the bathtub, mm. which is why I couldn't shower. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's one of your answers. <laughs> there, yeah, you there were no bean sprouts until Peck's dad from Sung Lee started to produce them in mass for the whole of London, which was when Princess Fergie got married, apparently. That, but that is, that's in the exhibition. Is that, is that part of the exhibition? <laughs> There's just something around that in the exhibition, but definitely worth having a look at. There's this whole story around that, yeah. Um, yes. Hello. Hi. Um, you spoke a little bit about authenticity, and especially that the limitation of that, you know, the ideas around being put in a box, that's not how it's supposed to be. Um, do you think that there is any role for 
authenticity, maybe that's not the right word, but for tradition and looking back um, at how it used to be in sort of building and moving forward. Oh, I, th I think authenticity, you can go back to books, right? Even old Chinese books, you see how something was originally conceived and made and handed down, right? And it changes. Uh, sure. I think, I, you know, I always say this is basically the innovation of today can become yeah. the authenticity of tomorrow. So exactly. it's completely, it's, it's, on a, it's on a sliding mm. scale. Mm. And it's, it's for whoever's partaking mm. in that expression that is determining what is authentic and what is not authentic. Mm. And I think um, that the, the more you embrace that, the, more, the less you give yourself a headache, number one. Mm. And number two, the more you begin to enjoy the food for what it is. Mm. You enjoy the food for a pleasurable, flavorful experience. You stop trying to overthink it, going, well, that's from there, that's from there, that's from there. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, I, we're not going to be able to take, take any more questions, but I think to just sort of finish that off, I think authenticity, to me, a lot of it's about authentic or traditional techniques mm. around cooking that are probably more important than... Mm. Uh, the, the finished dish, <laughs> you mm. know, because you learn the core techniques of any type of cuisine or anything at all, and then you can create what you want. Um, but outside of that, does it really matter? So long as it tastes good, exactly. we all don't care. What? What's that? You don't agree? Okay. Well, thank, um, well, well thank, thank you for finishing off this to chat. But the, 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 I, 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 if you don't mind, panel, I, I'll talk on, on your behalf on this because I think that a lot of this discussion has been around adaptability. And, 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 and actually, I think that is a unanimous agreement between us that, our, that the core mm -hmm. aspect of Chinese food, whether it's British or not, around the world, is that we are very, very adaptable people mm. Mm. and our cuisine and our techniques around the cuisine lend uh, the, 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 the sort of skills that we need to be able mm. to adapt over time. Yep. That, that's what I believe the panel have agreed. Yeah. Um, uh, so <laughs> I, uh, on that, I, a, a massive round of applause. <laughs> season. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for skillful, insightful, brilliant sharing. Yes. Helen. He's not Helen. just a pretty face. Sorry? He's not just a pretty face. No, it turns out he's not. None of you are. Uh, <laughs> 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 Helen, Angela, Andrew, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Ken Hom. <laughs> Thank you. Really, really, I know everyone here agrees that was moving, it was insightful, it was really fascinating. We're really honoured and privileged to have had you speak tonight. Thank you so much. This is the beginning of the food season. I'm just going to say three very quick things coming up. Food and farming and the future of food, absolutely essential with Henry Dimbleby and an amazing panel. Followed by eating for the elderly, the pleasure, the difficulty, the importance, a subject no one talks about with Joan Bakewell. You've got to come to that. And then love it or hate it, you cannot ignore it, food and social media, <laughs> Poppy O'Toole, Itamar Shrulevich and Chetna McCann. Those are just the next three. Then there are loads more. It's going to be amazing. Come to everything. Thank you for being an amazing audience.